series on grace. We're still trying to find uh, the words to I know it's available, but I haven't been over to the bookstore to get it. Uh, that other song that we were talking about, you know. We're still we're trying to find all the songs on grace we can find. There's so few in the books. I'm not kidding. It's a tragedy, tragedy. The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and as a critic of thoughts and in, uh, uh, of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. We're going to give ourselves to the doctrinal study of grace after we spend a few moments in silent prayer, confessing all known sin, bringing every thought into captivity, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, loving Lord, for the privilege of being in the royal family by means of your matchless grace. Now may God the Holy Spirit glorify God the Son as we seek to uh, study this matchless subject of grace, open our the eyes of our spiritual understanding. We may grasp these things you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, to those who are watching by television and listening by means of radio, we want to suggest to you that... This book, Grace, is available to you without cost, without charge. It is provided for you on a grace basis. That means you can't buy it, you can't earn it, you can't deserve it, you can't work for it, you can't plead for it. All you do is ask for it and it's yours. It takes the entire doctrine of grace that I'm teaching here in our Bible classes and making it available in printed form for you. And when it's all available to you, it will be the only systematic approach to grace that's on the market. Not that I'm that uh, inventive, but I am just have a, a categorical type mind, and I'm putting uh, everything together in a categorical form so that we'll be studying everything from pre-salvation grace through salvation grace through uh, post-salvation grace through uh, e grace in eternity future. All these four general areas uh, which are divided into uh, seven sub-areas are very important. And we're now looking at the definition of grace and under sub-point B we have seen the basis of grace, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The means of grace, uh, the work of Christ, uh, was the means by which God could be, remain consistent with himself, uncompromised, and still bless the human race. And we looked at the blood of the cross, the means by which uh, his, uh, he, God the Father is satisfied with the work of Christ. Then we saw the principle of grace, uh, which is that God has uh, provided for each member of the human race perfect and total and complete blessing, totally apart from anything that man can do. Uh, and then the policy of grace, that is that God gives and man receives. Therefore, everything depends on God and nothing depends upon man. And now, if you missed these previous studies, I uh, recommend that you uh, write for or uh, call and ask our number is 48 grace by the way it's called ask for the cassette tape on the, uh, the uh, definition of grace and we'll be happy to send it to him. mention uh, the fact that uh, what we're talking about the the concepts of grace because uh, see we teach these bible classes consecutively one after the other after the other. I don't have one subject for Sunday morning first class, another subject for Sunday morning second class, another subject for Tuesday night, another, another subject for Thursday night. I just keep on teaching. I don't preach sermons. They're an abomination to me. I hate sermons. They're worthless. I teach the Bible study, 
and categorical Bible study is to take the whole teaching of the Bible and put it together in simple points that we can understand on given subjects, which is called a doctrine. And where I finish in one class, I pick it up in the next. And there's only one way to study the Bible, and that's the way we're doing it correctly. You can study any way you want. If you want, you can pick up anything you want to do. You're free. But this point means that if you don't understand these four things, the next are going to be next uh, to impossible for you to understand. Okay, so ask for those and ask for these as well, because we're moving into uh, the next point uh, in our subject. Uh, or, or under these, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. Now point five is the plan, uh, or uh, the, uh, yeah, the plan of grace. The plan of grace begins actually with at the point of salvation. Though it was laid in eternity past, it begins with the point of salvation and continues into eternity future. and covers absolutely every facet of living and dying in this life and uh, everything beyond death in the future life, in eternity future. And again, the plan of grace rejects any contribution from the source of man. You cannot help God at all. I have heard for years people say, you do the best you can and then let God do the rest. That's a lie! That's from hell itself! That's what Satan would have you believe. God has done it all. It's all done by God. All you do is receive it. God is, has a perfect plan, and there's no room in a perfect plan for imperfect contributions. If you're flying an airplane, you're a passenger in, a, uh, in an airplane, and it's going, uh, let's say, 750 miles an hour, can you get out and give it a push? No more can you help God in His grace plan in life for you at anything. It's all done for you. And the plan of God rejects everything that is related to human contributions to that plan. That's the grace of God. Six, the genius of God. is the revelation of His grace and that revelation is called the Word of God or Bible doctrine which is the categorical study of the Word of God. That's the genius of God and there's no way you're going to ever dis discover anything about grace apart from that which is recorded in the Word of God. Now, you aren't going to find it in nature. You're not going to find it in uh, society, in philosophy. You're not going to find grace defined and expressed for you or revealed for you in any other place than the Word of of the living God and the the consummation of the plan of God and the grace of God is not found in the Old Testament it is not even found in the Gospels it is found in the what Paul calls the mystery doctrine of the church age which is uh, be, begins with uh, the uh, the day of Pentecost and and moves on from there to the day of the rapture as revealed by the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter and the other uh, John in their writings 
but as described by Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, when he says that you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is the mystery, mystery doctrine, made known to me by revelation. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery doctrine is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Now, grace has always been known. But grace has not been uh, completely known until it came in the Lord Jesus Christ. For the law, we read in John chapter 1, came by Moses, but grace and doctrine came by means of Jesus Christ. But you have to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ in, the, in one part of his ministry offered himself as the Jewish Messiah. And as he offered himself as the Jewish Messiah, uh, that, that was rejected. And it was then that the fullness of his grace became known uh, as he, he uses, uh, be, as John tells us, that uh, he is the one who gives us grace in place of grace, uh, grace added to grace, grace upon grace. So that beginning with the, uh, the, the hypostatic union, certain phases of it, and continuing now through to the rapture of the church, we find grace explained for us. And so uh, the revelation is found only in the Word of God. You'll not find it anywhere else, and all the seeking after it somewhere else is not going to be found. And tragically, people who sing about grace don't know anything about it. The maximum expression of grace was the cross. And therefore the cross becomes the great pattern of grace. God did the doing on the cross. Nobody helped him. Nobody contributed to it. It was his work alone. God the Son bearing your sins in his own body on the tree. Once again, man does the receiving. And so since God did the most for us when we were yet sinners, when we were enemies, when we were aliens. How much more shall he do for us now that we are members of his royal family, the body of Christ? Please take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 5. You'll notice Romans 5 begins, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith. Now the word justified, I should give you a test. We talked about it in our last class. It means to be declared righteous. And we studied it in Romans chapter 3. To be declared righteous. Justification is the doctrine that is involved. which simply says that the sinful humanity is declared as righteous as God is on the basis of faith and faith alone. Not justified, never sinned, woefully inadequate, as righteous as God, because the doctrine of imputation tells us that the righteousness which belonged to God was imputed or charged to the account of the believing sinner. So it is not just as if I'd never sinned. It's the very righteousness belonging to God which has been charged to us. Now, we have peace with God through faith. Again, faith is non-meritorious. Anybody can have it. The idiot, 
the the moron anybody can have faith it doesn't make any difference how intelligent you are or how uh, stupid you are you can have faith it does not depend on human perspicacity then uh, uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ verse 2 through whom we have gained access by faith into what this grace this grace wherein which we permanently stand says the Greek then he goes on to point out uh, verse 6 you see at the right time when we were still now you'll notice some of the characteristics of the human race why we were still powerless is his first char characteristics why we're still powerless Christ died for the ungodly there is the second characteristic very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man though for a good man someone might dare possibly dare to die but God demonstrates his own love for us in this why we were yet sinners so the third designation is sinners Christ died for us then he goes on to point out in verse 9 since we have now been justified by his blood the the ex expiatory work of Christ on the cross how much more here it is the first the how much more there's your first how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him for if when we were God's enemies now we have another term added to the three we already have seen why we were God's enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his son how much more second much more uh, shall we be saved through his life not only is this so but we shall also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have whom we have now received reconciliation then he points out just as uh, uh, therefore verse 12 as sin entered the world through one man Adam and death spiritual death through sin in the same way spiritual death came to all men because all sinned and because before the law was given sin was not taken into account uh, where there is no law nevertheless death reigned uh, from Adam to Moses even though it was not counted uh, then he goes on verse 15 but the gift is not like the trespass for if the many died by the trespass of one man how much more the third much more how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by grace by uh, of the one man Jesus Christ overflow to many again the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin the judgment followed one man's sin and brought condemnation but the gift the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification for if by the trespass of one man death reigned through the one man how much more ah five times we have how much more how much more how much more is God uh, uh, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Christ Jesus you see beloved how much more will he do for us if he did the most for you when you were powerless ungodly a sinner an enemy how much more will he do for you again by means because of the fact that you are in Jesus Christ you're the recipient of this fantastic grace beloved God is never impressed with what you do for him the arrogance of mankind to think that you can parade your good works before God and say to him God take a look at what I've done you have to accept me on the basis of what I've done check out my service for you check out I've been singing in the choir for 55 years I've been teaching a class ever since I could, uh, was saved I've been uh, driving a bus I've been visiting I've been working at the rescue mission I've been giving food to the poor I've been this that uh, I've given a million dollars since I've saved uh, I've been at Bible class every time the door is open you owe me something you don't understand grace because you God doesn't owe you a thing not a thing you're the recipient of fantastic <coughs> grace totally and completely the recipient of grace now having said all of this let me remind you that while man is without merit he is not without 
responsibility. Man does have responsibility under grace. Now, here is the word. What word does this responsibility come from? It comes from the word respond. It is the ability to respond. Man is accountable to respond to that grace. At the point of salvation, he must, he doesn't just stand there and, uh, and say, now, you know, do nothing. He believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a non-meritorious response, right? Faith is non-meritorious, but it is a response. It is the response to God's grace. You are responsible to respond to the grace of God by, well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you're not a Christian, if you're not born again, if you're not a child of God, the only response you can have is not to join a church. That's a work. Not to be baptized. That's a work. Not to raise your hand. That's a work. Not to go forward. That's a work. It is not to do anything but Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That is the response, and the only response, which is acceptable to God for his matchless grace in providing so great salvation for you. Now that's where a good portion of Christians will agree. But that's where we, it ends. From there on, it's work, 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 work. It's impress God with what I do, impress God with who I am. Somehow, God has to bless me. No. Absolutely not. It has nothing to do, even after salvation. We are always the total products of the grace of God. But we do respond. See, We respond to Bible doctrine. We respond to the filling or the control of the Holy Spirit. We do res We have a a response to all that God has for us. You grow by means of this to the place where, having responded all of these times, you now have capacity, and God can pour out the grace blessing that he has intended for you. Man is accountable and obligated to make non-meritorious decisions which are compatible with the grace of God. I have uh, a few definitions of grace that have come from three of my favorite authors that I'd like to share with you. They're, they're in the book, and it's available to you, but uh, this is what I would like to share. Three of my favorite authors on the subject of grace. First, Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer. Dr. Chafer says, and it's, this is so rich, that uh, I wish I could write it out here and go in it point by point. You can almost preach or uh, teach this whole thing. Grace is the uncompromised, unrestricted, unrecompensed, loving favor of God toward sinners. It is unearned blessing. It is a gratuity. Grace is the limitless unrestricted love of God for the lost, acting in full compliance with the exact, unchangeable demands of his own righteousness through the sacrificial death of Christ. Grace is much more than love. It is love set absolutely free and made to be a triumphant victor over the righteous judgment of God against the sinner. Absolutely free. Love set free to do. Kenneth Wiest, my, one of my, well, I'd say this, my favorite teacher when I was at Moody Bible Institute. Dr. Wiest was undoubtedly my fa the favorite teacher I've had in all of my life. And I loved him with a, a love that is unique. Uh, there were only, there, I had a lot of teachers, but the, he and Morris Nelson uh, were the two teachers at Moody that meant the most to me and I learned I think the most from but Dr. Weiss says this charis which is the Greek word in the classical Greek referred to a favor conferred freely with no expectation of return 
finding its only motive in the bounty and free-heartedness of the giver. This favor was always done to a friend, not to an enemy. Right here, Carus leaps forward an infinite distance, for the Lord Jesus died for his enemies, a thing unheard of in the human race. The love shown by God at the cross is foreign to the human race. Thus, Carus comes to its highest and most exalted meaning in the New Testament. And then thirdly, I'd uh, quote from Dr. Charles Ryrie, who has written an exceptional volume also on the grace of God. First, he says, grace is unmerited favor. As a concise definition of grace, this serves well. More elaborate definitions have their place, but simply stated, grace is unmerited favor. It is undeserved on the part of the recipient. It is undeserved and unearnable. Second, grace is not cheap. Grace is expensive. It is free to the recipient, but costly to the donor. To use the word cheap in the same breath with grace seems almost blasphemous. It cost our Lord Jesus his life. Some may insult grace, reject it, trample on it, or disgrace it, but that does not lower its infinite value. Third, it is not easy to believe someone who offers grace. It's not easy to believe someone who says that he or she will do something good for us that we do not deserve. Fourth, grace that is received changes one's life and behavior. The gospel is the good news of the grace of God to give forgiveness and eternal life. Let's keep that gospel so full of grace that there is no room for anything else to be added to dilute or pollute the true grace of God. Thayer, in his English-Greek lexicon of the New Testament, says that grace is that merciful kindness by which God exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps them, strengthens them, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to exercise the Christian virtues. My definition builds on all of these, and I have already given it to you. Grace is the love made free to bestow unlimited blessing on, man, on, on mankind, free to do everything in the heart of the one loving us on behalf of the unlovely, unlovable, helpless, and hopeless. Dr. Wiest paraphrases Archbishop Trench when he says, quote, It is hardly too much to say that the mind of God has in no word uttered itself and all that was in his heart more distinctly than this. I can't tell you the number of times as I have sat typing my notes, contemplating this, this magnificent theme of grace, that I have stopped because... I could no longer see the text. I couldn't see the typewriter as, as the, the tears began to flow from my eyes. Because the more you see the grace of God, and the more you see of your own worthlessness, your own uh, bankruptcy, your total depravity, the more you appreciate the fact that we're saved by the grace of God. And as Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. We are what we are at any given time by the grace of God. It's amazing grace. And it's no wonder that it, the subtitle of Dr. Chafer's book on grace is Grace, the Glorious Theme. There is no more glorious theme. If, I remember many years ago when I was first saved, 
the pastor of the church was a retired minister who was brought back into this little church in Chicago to sort of carry it through its dying throes. And when he finally had to retire for old age, he advertised that he was going to preach on what Christianity has done for the world. If, if there was one sermon I could preach, he said, this is the sermon I would preach. He was about 78 years of age, and with all these years in the ministry, if there was one sermon I could preach, this is what I would preach, he said. And his sermon topic was what Christianity has done for the world, bringing hospitals, bringing the women the, women, the opportunity to vote, all those things. And I was just I was just a young believer at the time. And I wasn't led to the Lord by him. It was by the young lady from Moody Bible Institute who was in the church. But there was his subject. And I thought to myself, if there's one sermon that I would ever have to preach, if, if I was limited to one subject, that I would ever have to preach. It would have to be the grace of God. Someone has said that Dr. Barnhouse never taught anything else except the book of Romans. That's not true. That is true. I'm sure it is true of uh, Doc Latham. He never taught outside the book of Romans. The pastor of, of Northside Gospel Center in Chicago the man behind the foundation of the Awana Clubs, uh, the uh, great, great old war horse who began as a music uh, director and a song leader and a piano player and eventually uh, was promoted, just like Schaefer. Lewis Berry Schaefer began as a song leader for C.I. Schofield. And one day Schofield called him in and said, I believe you have the gift of communication. He said, oh, no. He said, yes. And so he went to, to study and teach. He never knew the original languages, and yet he found the Dallas Seminary so that the original languages could be taught to men so they could go back in the original and find out what the Word of God had to say. But just like Chafer was promoted to become a PT, so did he. And I was thinking the other day, I began my ministry as a song leader for Gene McGee <laughs> in Youth for Christ in Chicago. So, uh, however, I was never a musician. Never, ever been accused of that in my life, uh, being a musician. But I was a song leader. I directed the choir uh, on a number of occasions. But uh, uh, the Lord had other plans. The point is that grace will always be the theme. As uh, it says here, grace shall always be uh, the theme of my song. Uh, I can't help but think in terms of, of grace, the most glorious and wonderful word in the English language, the grace of God. And so looking at the definition of grace would help us now to stop and look at some of the words in the original language. So that because all, although I have already given to you uh, the, some of the, the, the meaning, uh, charis, uh, I will, however, begin with the Hebrew. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of despot done to the uh, Hebrew translations. This is the basic root word for grace. It's C-H-E-N, chain. This is the... Uh, the hard sound, uh, the H is not connected. Don't confuse it with the TH or the T. The T. There are two T's in the Hebrew. One looks like this, one looks like this. Uh, with, uh, when you put the dot in it, it changes the, 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 uh, the T to TH. Uh, but this is the hard, uh, rough sound. It isn't chen, it's chen. It's, a, it's the guttural uh, pronunciation. Uh, this is H, and this is <laughs> CH. From this, you get uh, this word. Now, N in the center of a word, C-H-A-N-A-N. -A -N -A -N. 
in the middle of a word, the N uh, just looks like this. When it's at the end, the tail goes down So in Hebrew. So this is Canaan. And then there's this word. This is C-H-E-S-E-D-H. Chesed. Uh, 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 the D with the dot is, is a D. Without the dot, it's pronounced with a D-H sound. Chesed. Now, what has happened so many times... The, is that they have translated this loving kindness. The translators have translated it loving kindness. But it's more than loving kindness. It's really grace. The root, me, chain, means to bend or to stoop with the concept of bending to someone or stooping to someone who is helpless and hopeless. Stooping with the idea of condescending favor. It is unexpected, it is undeserved, it is not secured uh, uh, by anything. It is the gracious condescension of a superior to an inferior. Now Chesed carries it a little farther. Uh, Snaith says it tends to carry with it the idea of unmerited favor or of supreme graciousness and condescension on the part of the giver who is superior. There is not the slightest obligation on the part of the superior to show his pain. It is all his generosity. And furthermore, there is no thought of any charge of harshness against him if he is not gracious. The suppliant that's the one to whom he stoops. The suppliant has not the slightest claim, nor is he any position to anything to enforce his claim beyond the actual petition itself. And so, putting together the meaning of the Hebrew word, first of all, it is the condescension of one to another. It is favor, in the case of God, divine favor. It is loving kindness. It is, uh, however, unexpected and undeserved. It is without obligation. Sixthly, the person cannot be criticized if he does not show this grace. Seventhly, it is firm. Eight, it is persistent. Nine, it is steadfast. And ten, it gives of itself. H.C. Woodring, Jr. says, The enjoyment of grace depends on man's right relationship to God, but the exercise of grace depends only on the steadfast, loving kindness of God. Now we move to the New Testament, which is the Greek, and in the Greek we have one word, C-H-A-R-I-S. However, there are two related words. There is this word, the S at the end looks like this, the S in the middle looks like this, so that you could, you know I'm writing the same word. C-H-A-R-I-S-M-A. -S Charisma. Charisma is a gracious gift. And there is this word, which is the uh, the verb form C H uh, A R I Z O M A I, which means to give graciously. The noun is used 155 times 
Most of them in, are found in the Pauline epistles under the mystery doctrine of the church age. In the uh, theological dictionary of New Test in the dictionary of New Testament theology, Colin Brown, editor, he says, "Quote for Paul, Charis is the essence of God's decisive saving act in Jesus Christ, which took place in His sacrificial death, and also of all its consequences in the present and in the future." The classical Greek meaning that which affords pleasure, joy, delight, charm, loveliness. That's nowhere found in the New Testament, thought of grace. Though God's grace does afford pleasure, joy, and delight in the recipient of that grace, it's going to result in your having these things. Charis doesn't mean that. And Charis is impossible to understand apart from from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John 1, 17, For the law came by Moses, but, but grace and doctrine came by Jesus Christ. Because from the source of His fullness, we have all received grace taking the place of grace, or grace heaped upon grace. Ephesians 1, 7, In Him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, we have redemption in His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of of his grace. 2 7, in order that in the ages to come he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So that grace is impossible to find apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. In him was grace. And you see, when we are placed in Christ, as uh, our position, then we are in the same sphere of grace that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, by way of summary, grace is all that God is free to do for mankind without compromising His divine essence because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. The doctrine of grace means that all things, including salvation, are received from God as a free gift, never earned, deserved, or merited. Therefore, since grace is the work of God for us, and never the result of human works, God's divine essence is never compromised. And no one is blessed in the human race because they're good. No one is blessed in the human race because they're moral. No one is blessed in the human race because they bless others. No. The Christian way of life is infinitely superior to all kinds of morality. While the Christian is moral, of course, morality is not the Christian way of life. Morality is the result of self-determination. Grace is the result of God's determination. Furthermore, the virtue demanded by God is greater than all morality. The inner life of virtue, honor, is not something a person can do for himself. It's something God provides in grace. Besides, anything an unbeliever can do is not the Christian way of life. So, the life of reformation, like morality, is produced by mankind. But only grace can produce the superhuman life of power, virtue, honor, integrity, which is so much greater than morality. Grace is the manifestation of God's unmerited favor because of the efficacious work of Christ. Grace begins in the treatment of the entire human race, for God begins with all sinners and begins there. It prepares salvation. Then it provides, in, in, in preparation for salvation. Then it provides salvation. Then it provides post-salvation. And then it even provides for eternity future. Whatever God does is all done by Him, never compromises ever, ever at all. 
In grace, God does the doing, man does the receiving. God works, man benefits. It's not that God benefits from our work, which is suggested by religion, and even a large part of Christianity. There are missionaries who teach God can't get along without you. Wrong! God doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. Never will. He, that he uses us ought to be an evidence of his grace and in some of us his sense of humor. No question about it. Grace means that God knows best, which is why we have so many mandates from him that run totally contrary to our natural desires. Our natural desires want to do one thing, but he knows better, and grace will provide what's best. A relationship with God must precede a fellowship with God. Grace has established a non-meritorious method of establishing that relationship by non-meritorious faith plus nothing in the finished work of Christ. We have a relationship with God. We are children of God through faith in Christ. Grace means that God has already provided everything necessary for us to have that relationship with Him. He's also provided everything we need for fellowship with Him in time. So it's not dependent on human works. Since mankind is spiritually dead, even spiritually brain dead, God's eternal policy of grace for salvation cannot in any way depend on man. Therefore, it must depend on God, and God provides it, called common grace. The point of salvation, you can't even take, expect your uh, faith to be translated to God apart from efficacious grace, unrelated to feelings, ecstatics, or emotion of any kind. Once you've entered the plan of God by faith, you live by grace. Everything that's necessary for you to maintain fellowship with God is by grace. At the point of salvation, God does 40 things for you. Every one of those things is done by grace. You don't feel one of them. And even when you're disciplined, it's disciplined by grace. It's grace that does it. God correction because He wants to help you. And as you grow spiritually, you reach the place of super grace. Multiplied grace in Scripture. Grace be multiplied to you. Super grace. And when it's time for you to check out of this life, beloved, you move from time to eternity, there's dying grace to get you from time to eternity. That causes you to walk the high golden bridge. It's so wonderful and so glorious. Once you get on the other side, there's surpassing grace. Surpassing grace followed by rewarding grace. All of this provided for you. And each person of the Godhead functions under the grace policy to provide for you. The grace of God the Father used His divine omniscience to pro program the doctrine of divine decrees. He judged those sins uh, that were, uh, which were imputed to the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of God the Son received that judgment when He was on the cross. He was willing to become true humanity to bear our sins on the cross. In the grace of God, the Holy Spirit takes the gospel and makes it a reality to us as brain-dead humanity and uh, multiplies that grace to us. As Dr. Ryrie says in his book, there is no division of doctrine that is not related in some way or another to the concept of grace. Furthermore, grace is the doctrine that divides Roman Catholicism from Protestantism. Grace is the doctrine that divides Calvinism from Arminianism. Grace is the doctrine that divides liberal theology from evangelical theology. The Roman Church holds that grace is mediated through its priests and through its sacraments. Calvinism emphasizes the utter helplessness of man apart from God, whereas Arminianism sees the grace of God cooperating with the works of man. Liberal theology places the abilities of man to determine his own fate and affect his own salvation as the cornerstone of its doctrine, whereas evangelical theology teaches that God's grace is absolutely necessary. Liberalism says that in every day and in every way, man is getting better and better. <clears throat> Thus he doesn't need God's help and certainly not the grace of God. I close this 
increment with the final words or the opening words of Dr. Chafer's book on grace. <clears throat> he says the exact and discriminant meaning of the word grace should be crystal clear to every child of God. With such insight only can he feed his own soul on the inexhaustible riches which it unfolds. And with such an understanding only can he be enabled clearly to pass on to others its marvelous transforming theme. And then I've saved Jerry Bridges' definition for last. He says this, What then is the grace by which we are saved and under which we live? Grace is God's free and unmerited favor shown to guilty sinners who deserve only judgment. It is the love of God shown to the unlovely. It is God reaching downward to people who are in rebellion against Him. Grace stands in direct opposition to any supposed worthiness on our part. Ah, yes, beloved. Grace is a glorious theme. And now that we have a pretty good definition, we're ready to move into the first of the four areas and on Tuesday night we will study pre-salvation grace in its two aspects. I trust that you'll be ready for it. And I look to those who are listening by radio or watching by television once again to offer you the book on grace. It is absolutely free, contains most of the material that I'm sharing with my local congregation, but it is available to you without charge. The address will be given in just a few moments. But I want you to know something, that if you're watching or listening, that Jesus Christ is the epitome of God's grace. And in grace, He had you in mind when He went to the cross of Calvary. If you were the only person who ever lived, He still would have gone to the cross on your behalf. For it was there on the cross that He bore your sins in His own body on the tree. God the Father judged God the Son on behalf of of you so that God the Father could show you grace in salvation and may, meaning that the only way you can be saved is not by works of righteousness but by means of grace through faith believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved right where you are it's not by anything you do it's by what you think and right now you can think I believe that Jesus Christ died for me on the cross and in that moment of time you will have eternal life. And if you'll write to me, I'll not only send you the book on grace, but I will also send you a little booklet that is entitled, Now That I Believe, that will tell you how you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And along with it, a book that teaches you that you can't lose your salvation, eternal security. Under no circumstances will you ever lose that salvation. And then remember I told you about the 40 things that God does at the point of salvation? Here they are in this booklet entitled 40 Blessings of Grace. These four booklets I'll send to you, and you know something? I'm not going to call on you. There's no visitation team from our church that will call on you. We don't b believe in either of those things. You will have your privacy to believe on the Lord, and then if you want to come here or go somewhere else, that's your business, for you need to grow in grace after you're saved. And we leave that with, between you and the Lord. But we are available to help you to grow in grace by the teaching, the consistent, systematic teaching of the Word of God here at Grace Memorial Bible Church. Now let us pray. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of teaching the wonderful truth about this magnificent Word. Grace. Grace, the glorious theme. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Yes, it has been by the grace of God that we we're saved. It's by the grace of God that we're kept. It's by the grace of God that we are blessed. It's by the grace of God that we shall one day look upon our Lord Jesus face to face. Thank you so much for your matchless grace. Thank you for all that grace means to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. One God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Therefore, nobody can represent you to God. You are your own priest. 
And therefore, you have the opportunity in these few moments before we study the Word to represent yourself to God, to speak to Him as you would to anyone else. He is anxiously waiting for your communication. You approach not in your own goodness. You approach not in your own worthiness. But you approach because you are in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the second person of the Godhead, God the Son. And therefore, because since you are in Christ, you have a royal priesthood, and you can approach the throne of grace at any time. It is wise.